I feel like we have a similar sense of humor. And uh, yeah, you're like, I'm going to put my fitness clothes on and you should be honored. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, that's hilarious. But I was like, how many other people would be like offended? <laughs> but I think it's a real shirt for you. Come on. <laughs> I think I think it's awesome. But do you offend people when you because I feel like I say things that I think are funny and people are like, is he joking or is he serious? I think probably I haven't, I knew you, so I knew you wouldn't be offended. I wouldn't have done that if I didn't know you. <laughs> so. Okay. So, all right, Aaron, t today we're going to talk about who knows what. Previously, you came on Exploring Mind and Body as a guest, and that was a year ago. I can't believe it. So if you, get out of here. I'm trying to, um check my feed to see if we're actually live on Facebook, but um, you you previously or since have written a book, and what, tell us what your book is about. My book is about why so many of us diet, why it ends up failing, and what the real problem is. So I was one of these people who was always on a diet, about to go on a diet, needing to go on a diet, complaining to everybody that I should go on a diet. And I never really saw the connection between what I was eating, why I always felt like I needed to go on a diet, and what behaviors happened before I was eating that led me down this path. So a couple years ago, I figured it all out for myself, and this is just basically a how-to guide that I would have loved to have had when I was there. And so what's the so what's the deal? Let's let's get into it. Why why can't people stick to diets? Uh, two things. First of all, because they go on a diet in the first place, they don't actually plan a lifestyle change. They're just wanting to lose ten pounds for the wedding or spring break or short term thinking. First problem. Also, the food is really horrible that most of us are eating. It's full of sugar. It's full of chemicals. It's full of things that hijack us. But the first one, so many of us that have been in the diet trenches, like I used to be, I used to work for one of the big diet companies. To give you a hint, Oprah works for them too. <laughs> it's all about the food. It's let's talk about how many bagels you can eat or how much bread you can eat. It's never, why did you gain 15 pounds? And what in your life are we going to switch up or look at or analyze so when you get to that magic number where everything is wonderful with unicorns and rainbows, then you're not going to gain it back because you don't have any new thought process or coping mechanisms. Because it took me a really long time to realize you can lose weight on paleo or veganism or macrobiotics or keto or whatever. But if you don't change the fact that you go to food when life kicks your butt, it's not going to do any good. Because you're still going to find a way to overeat keto truffles. or you know, I know people that have eaten eight lar bars before. <laughs> so it's really not about necessarily just nutrition. Because there is a lot of confusion that, you know, it doesn't matter if it's some whole food. It doesn't matter if it's, you know, it's actually, it all, first of all, it always matters. Portions always matter. Calories always matter to a certain extent. But also, what about your life that wasn't working, that you gained the weight in the first place, that is going to be different this go-round, or else you're going to find that weight rather quickly? we got Louise in here. Hi, Louise. Louise, if you hey, have Louise. questions for Aaron, let us know. We're talking about, well, previously we did a show, uh, an interview, and it was called Why I Can't Stick to My Diet. And then since that, that was a year ago, we, we were talking earlier, we can't actually believe it's been that long. Um, what's, what's your book called, Erin? It's called Why Can't I Stick to My Diet, Feel Better, Look Good, and Never Ask That Question Again. Do you have it there? Yeah. Show it, show it to us. Why oh, can't? Awesome. Yeah, we got it. We have a few screens going on right now, so I'm very... <laughs> <laughs> That's the one. Okay. Awesome. So you launched this at Christmas time, you said? This yeah, December 18th was the big launch date. So yeah. right in time for New Year's resolutions and a lot of like press and just a lot of end of the year stuff. So, oh, good things. Okay, so those people, I mean, I, th I think it's interesting because like when we say we don't count calories, I don't know exactly where you are on, on, on the specifics of we teach, but... 
for us, it's like, don't, we don't count calories. We tell you not to step on a scale. We don't do the numbers thing. Like don't calculate the numbers. I kind of think that's what you're talking about. But people are like shocked. And I feel like if you do that and then stop doing that, you don't have the tools. And I'm guessing that's what you were talking about when you said, when you were saying like, you, you kind of, you don't have that. Like, what do you do when you stop, when you stop counting or when you stop weighing your food or yourself? Like, what do we do? Is that kind of what you're talking about when you were? Yeah, I, I hope that I'm hoping I'm more clear this time. I'm not saying that you need to become the opposite, the swing to the other direction. But my point is that if all you're doing is being obsessed with the food and obsessed with the scale, and like like you were saying, like I, don't know, I know your approach as well, is nutrition always matters. It always matters what you're eating. But you can still overeat healthy food. <laughs> you can still overeat whatever it is if your mind isn't right, if your head isn't on straight. People do it all the time. So if you're coming from, if you look at food as fuel versus entertainment or your friend or your go-to when life kicks your, kicks your butt, that's what I mean. Because, like I said, the lower bars are people that will eat an entire jar of almond butter <laughs> when they have a bad day. Like, that's not a good idea. <laughs> Instead of just feeling stressed or bummed out or, you know, acknowledging that they're stressed having some sort of other way to handle it, like journaling or calling a friend or meditating, handling it because that's an opportunity they have. Okay, so I have this feeling, what am I going to do about it? Okay, maybe I need to rethink the job I have or maybe I need to talk to my husband about how life could be a little easier at home because you're not going to find the answers to life's problems in a jar of peanut butter or almond butter. There just isn't any answer, <laughs> any great quandary in a jar of food. So realizing the purpose of food, which is to fuel us, and that's it. It's not entertainment, not our friend, it's just food. So to circle back to what you were saying, it's not, you know, getting super anal about the calories, super anal about the scale is not going to serve you long term either. So what so we're looking at emotional, right? So yeah. like what's the emotional root of the issue? How do we find that? How do we dig deep and make make that discovery by willing to do the, the the honest work it's sort of like that Marie Kondo thing everyone's doing where they're like taking out all their stuff <laughs> and overloading the, the donation places <laughs> with all their junk like it doesn't spark joy well I'm not saying food should spark joy but if you're not really ever digging out everything and looking at it you're just sort of shoving stuff into your you know proverbial closet it's never going to get any better. So you have to really analyze. Like my favorite is people that gain it over the holidays. I just really love Christmas. Like now you gain like 15 pounds in <laughs> two months. That's not really loving Christmas. That's like, I could do the math, but that's a lot of really loving Christmas. Like what happened between, cause in the States, Christmas really starts like November 1st, or you'd say Thanksgiving is last week of November. What are those eight weeks was going on? Well, it turns out that their mother was sick, their kids were doing this, so they were doing a lot of stress eating. Okay, so let's really, for once and for all, address the stress eating, because sure, we could put them on a weight loss protocol, they would lose weight, but are they changing how they think? Because until you change how you think, and you don't go to food when life is being life, you're going to have that default mechanism in your brain where it thinks, life is kicking my butt, where's the almond butter? So that needs to really be addressed. So in the same way, I take everything out of your closet, look at it, or else it's really not going to be able to spark joy. Yeah, you know, it's funny. As we say it all the time, like, leading up to Christmas, it's like, it's here. It's not like a week before. You go to the parties, you go to, you stay up late, there's the alcoholic beverages, there's the snacks, treats, desserts. And I think that's interesting how, how you said, like, it's not like it's not the 15 pounds that you gain weight. That's not the problem, or whatever it is. The problem is that there hasn't been any anything addressed internally that causes you to gain weight or eat every snack in front of you every time the six months of Christmas comes around. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that, that's the thing that's so amazing is that with Christmas is the I mean I've taken done it before for people or just people that, that like follow me is that. Christmas is actually like six meals out of 
you know, a hundred and so many. So it's like percentage wise, like 2% of the entire, you know, months of November or December and like the first week of January. It's the mindset of like, it's a free for all is what gets people in trouble. Because even if you ate, you know, a little bit extra, those six meals, you're not going to gain 15 pounds from that. It's the junk in the break room. It's overdoing it at every party. It's every time you go shopping, you have the giant mocha and the cookie from Starbucks. That's where 15 pounds comes from. You know what's interesting is I think people, like, <laughs> they try to pretend that it's not like they didn't overindulge. <laughs> and then you see someone, like, after the holidays, and you're like, uh, <laughs> what yeah, happened? Yeah, a little, a little, a little wor- worry, for, like, a, little, a little harsh, yeah. <laughs> Bad. So what can we do to look for or address some of these issues that we're talking about? Like how can we find out like what's going on or find a different mechanism other than ample amounts of food that we could, we should be eating or shouldn't be eating? What I've noticed is a really good just metric to see if you're emotionally eating or you're actually hungry is would you eat chicken and broccoli? Would you eat the grilled chicken breast and broccoli? Because if you will only have ice cream right now, because after talking to your sister-in-law, she aggravates you so much, only ice cream will cut it. Emotional. If you just happen to be hungry and you talk to your sister-in-law and you would eat chicken and broccoli, then maybe you're really hungry. But a lot of us, it's like we have to have the sugar, we have to have the you know, flour, we have to have that crazy thing because it's not really hunger. It's this really bad habit we've gotten into of, I'm, I'm stressed out. I think I need this. The dopamine receptors are really excited because I think that's going to happen. And here we are. What? How do we know, like, if we don't know? <laughs> but if we I don't know. Really don't know. A really good way that I have clients do it is they take their emotional temperature before, during, and after each time they eat. So, for example... 20 minutes before you eat, how am I feeling physically, how am I feeling emotionally, and it can be things like, I feel fine physically, emotionally, I'm stressed out about work. And then halfway through your meal, you just pause. No one has to even know if you make a deal about it, because everything still tastes okay. Because sometimes you could be like, you know what, I'm done. Other times, this is really good, I'm going to keep on going. But giving yourself the 30 to 60 seconds just to acknowledge what's going on, take a breath, all right, I'm going to keep going. And then 20 minutes after you're done eating, you can look at yourself again, did everything digest well, how am I feeling emotionally? Because you could be like, oh, my God, why did I eat that? And doing a tailspin. Because if you have huge emotions after you eat, that's also a big warning sign. So ideally, emotions and our food run parallel. But a lot of us, they're just a giant spider way with problems. So that's also a pretty easy way for people to really analyze, like, am I emotionally eating? Am I, do I get really excited when it's time to eat? <laughs> do I really look forward to certain restaurants? Because when we're little, like, it's your birthday. We're going to celebrate with this giant cake. And Christmas means whatever your grandma made. So it's really easy that we all got in this habit but some of us, like I used to, took it way past <laughs> a level of normalcy where we're having a bad day and suddenly it's like you know, eight bags of candy. Or we see candy and we eat it and it makes us happy. So eliminating as much emotion with food is really the goal. So you wouldn't recommend, like, so what if you're everyone's going out together and you're like, oh, it's Friday night and we're getting together with friends and you're going to... TGI Fridays, you just love their pasta dish. Because there's a difference between being excited to go hang out with friends and being excited to just to have that food? I think it's very different. I mean, if you're going out with friends and you happen to be eating pasta, that's very different than you going out and eating pasta by yourself and getting excited about that. <laughs> like, really, like, the excitement in life is from human beings. It's not from macros, right? So... If you find yourself celebrating with food a lot, you know, and that really that happens a lot when you're thinking, when I was in my twenties, when I was when I went out, you know, tons and tons. I used to live in New York City, where there are days where I would go out three meals a day. But you um, go by now, yourself? No, I mean like with friends or coworkers, just because that's how it is in Manhattan. Now I'm 
older and live in the suburbs and life is pretty boring. But there are times when you go out to eat a lot. But not every time you go out to eat is it a huge celebration. Sometimes it's just lunch. And if you try to keep your food as normal as possible and get it on a really kind of routine food plan, not a diet, but you pretty much eat as normal as possible most of the time, there's a lot of comfort in that. There's a lot of routine in that. But so many of us look for excitement in food. Well, how exciting should your food really be? If it's really routine and you always pretty much eat the same way, your weight's not going to fluctuate. Your emotion's not going to fluctuate. Your blood sugar's not going to fluctuate. But we're so concerned about being deprived or being bored. Well, why does food make life interesting? Why is food being used in this way when really it's supposed to be human beings <laughs> in, our, in our life experiences? So maybe we need to recategorize how important food is, the excitement of food, like, you know, I can't tell you how many times or awesome how the vacation was, and they'll tell me about the food before they'll tell me about anything else. And I think it's so interesting because after you know a wedding or a big event, who's the first thing that's gone? <laughs> you know, you have your pictures, you have your memories, you have your videos now or whatever. But food is, I mean, it's it's gone. But so many of us are just talking about food. Yeah, I feel like some places would be more challenging than others. Like, let's take like New York, for example. Okay. I've been there a handful of times. And <laughs> the kitchens are so small. When we go there, we Airbnb. The kitchens are so small. And um, one of the places that we rented, the, in like the food cupboards and cabinets, there were like shoes and clothes. And I, <laughs> and I, I was like, oh my gosh. This, Of course, the spaces are small, but I was like, this is crazy, but... It seemed like most places we've been, well, every place we've been, the kitchens were almost never used. So, like, that's part of the culture, I'd imagine. Everyone just goes out to eat. Yeah. And we, no, I, sorry, I was just going to say, like, that must make it more challenging to make healthier decisions or not use food as a crutch to be, like, use it as a celebration or use it as whatever you have, like, what we're talking about here, I guess. Yeah, no, uh, I remember my first apartment in the city, my husband and I, first of all, we both couldn't be in the kitchen at the same time, and either the door to the fridge could be open or the dishwasher, not both. <laughs> and, we, and we had a pretty decent sized apartment by New York standards. I didn't have any you know, shoes in the oven. I actually did cook, and I've always cooked more than most people, just because I'm so picky and just want to know what's in my food. But in New York, for example, you can get really good food for the amount it would really cost you to make it. And it's so easy. I'm sure now it's even easier with Uber Eats and all those other services. Because you were always able to get takeout. But now with your Postmates and Uber Eats and all those other things, anything can be delivered. So, but yeah, I think in in most normal places, though, you can't get McDonald's delivered. (laughs) (laughs) Nor should you, if you can. So... Uh, uh, maybe slightly off topic that's no, that's normal in the city right like people just don't usually cook does everyone mostly go up most of the time I mean I have people that do cook but I do think people eat out a lot more in New York because it's just part of how life is and also because there's so many choices but um, you know or either go out or, or I think it's every restaurant delivers even the nice ones well, it seems like even like the places are so small, and I, I imagine the population. Like I had the opportunity to live in in a bigger city in Germany for seven months, and it was very similar. So many people, very small places. Um, now I forget what I was going to say. Oh, I think it's a bit more. Cha- it would be more challenging to get everyone to come over, like ten people, five people, to get over to a house instead of just going to a restaurant because there's so small space. Is that right? Exactly, and I mean, we had a dining room table, but we didn't have a dining room. We just, like, shoved it in, like, this little area. So I think that's a lot of it, too, is, I mean, I know people that don't even have, when I was back, when I lived in New York, they didn't even have a formal place to eat. They're eating on their couch. So, I mean, that would get old versus, you know, going to a restaurant where you can sit down and have a nice meal. So that, I believe, is a lot of it, too. 
But I do think people eat out now, I mean, across the board, a lot more than they used to, because a lot of people don't know how to cook. They don't plan ahead, which always gets in, like, the meal prep issue. But what's interesting is everyone loves the food, chain, food network. They're always going to watch, like, cakes being made and stuff, but nobody can cook, so I don't. They're living vicariously through the food network. Yeah, and I was watching some guy grocery games show the other day with my kids. I'm like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> and they kind of cool things, like these little tiny shopping carts. But given how most people can't even cook at all, I think it's really strange how everyone wants to watch other people cook. Tell me your favorite chapter. I know it's a tough question because books are like our children. My favorite our what? Favorite chapter of your book. Our favorite part mm-hmm. that if someone just picked it up to flip through, they had to read. I would say the intro because it's all about how I used to live and I think it's very funny because it's about how chaotic my mornings, afternoons, and evenings just being my kids were little. Like the kids are screaming and my husband's asking about the dry cleaning and just how my days used to be. I mean, it's not like I looked, I look forward to reliving those when I read it, but I think it's just so honest. I think a lot of people aren't very honest with what it's like when you're addicted to sugar. I think they just kind of downplay it. But when you are addicted to sugar, it's it, 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 your head hurts. Like, everything is really intense, but people always downplay it, like, across the board. But um, I wasn't doing that when I wrote it, so I think that's... I'm, I'm always kind of proud of that. What about, like... You know, like, we're doing a digestion challenge here coming up, and it's like... Tell me about that. That sounds cool. Well, it's, I like, 10, like, so we're doing 10 days, and we're not, like, crash course, like, detox weekend thing, but we're, like, if we had 10 days, and we had a a private group, and we showed people how they can improve their digestion in 10 days, then they would know what it's like when you don't, when you, like... How do you say? I think a lot of people think it's normal to have bloating every time you eat or indigestion. They, all, they totally do. They think it's normal. Like the amount of people that, that, that look at me strange when I say wheat's inflammatory. Like, what do you mean? Right, and then they, and then the opposite of that. Like, if you have anti-inflammatory foods that uh, that doesn't cause internal issues, then it, we have the chance then we have the chance or the ability to know what it's like to not always have those issues but i guess when i'm what i want to ask you is with the sugar like the same with digestion like a lot of people like um let's say constipation is a big thing for us for example like a lot of people have constipation or or maybe twice a week they have a bowel movement and we tell them that <laughs> that, that's that. that. <laughs> we, we tell them that that's not normal and then they look they're like what do you mean like, how often am I supposed to? So I guess when I compare that to sugar, like, how do we get people to know, like, what you're experiencing that's become your normal isn't normal? I, I mean, first of all, just that digestion challenge sounds amazing. Let me know how I can help because I definitely want to get my people in on that because a lot, yeah, I, I think the, the crazy thing is how many people have zero idea about dairy and wheat. They don't understand that you're not supposed to feel bloated, you're not supposed to feel horrible, that your pants are supposed to feel tight after you eat. That's not a good sign. Um, and people don't actually know what, how, what like that when you that when you start chewing, that's supposed to set off a whole chain reaction of your whole GI tract. So you're not supposed to go twice a week. <laughs> Ideally, the, the saliva starts, you know, like the dominoes. But side note. Um, with sugar, is it's first thing in the morning, like, where's my coffee, where's my frappuccino, where's my scone, because your head is throbbing, and until you get that sugar hit, you are nasty. So it's and, like a withdrawal period, like... It's like a withdrawal period, pretty much. If you start your day with co- with sugary coffee and you end it with sugary wine, if you have little bags of candy everywhere, if you think of excuses to drink sugary beverages if you notice you're you're not the same until you have your you know 4 p.m diet coke and the thing about diet coke is you might think there's no sugar in it the problem is is the artificial sweetener does mimic it for a while and the next thing you're getting back scales anyway so if your entire day is just you're just 
you know, leapfrogging from one sugar to another. And sometimes bread can cut it for a while. You can kind of, like, soothe it with some sort of, like, um, quick acting car for a while. That's a pretty good indication. But if you're ending your day, like, with wine, ice cream, candy, and you're starting it with something involving a lot of sugar, that's a really good indication. Also, withdrawal, moodiness. According to my husband, I was moody when I had a lot of sugar. I used to have a lot of acne. Um, I was getting cavities. And the weird thing about that is no one ever asked me when I was getting cavities, when I was having skin problems, what I was eating. None of these doctors ever asked. I figured it out on my own. So I think a lot of doctors have zero, and dentists have zero education about what we should be eating. It's all, you know, people like you and I who really drill down on nutrition that are aware of, like, you know, there's this stuff called inflammatory foods, because it's, an, it's a elective for them in medical school. It, they don't like to take often. <laughs> yeah, I heard they have, like, a couple hours of, like, nutrition. It's tough for us, like, we, like, you and I know that doctors, like, their goal is to prescribe medication, like, that's what they do. When you go see a doctor, you go there for like a band-aid, I would say, you go there for prescription medicine, but I think the majority of people are like, how can I go and get help? But that's not, that's not helping. That's not getting to the root of the issue. We need to look at food as fuel, as energy, as our lifeline, and we don't look at food like that. And like that, it drives me a bit crazy. And as as imagine, as imagine anyone in our field, like when, like it's like gospel, when someone in the doctor recommends something, that's exactly what you have to do. Um, but if you go to like a nutritionist or someone that knows about food and how it can heal your body, it's like, meh, that sounds like a bit more effort. So I'm going to pass on that. Thanks. Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, when I told my nutrition, when I told my dermatologist how, uh, how, <laughs> uh, reducing sugar can help your skin, she's like, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, or someone I know that uh, they were in the hospital for food poisoning, and I said, did they put you on a probiotic? They're like, no. I'm like, you need to get a probiotic anyway, especially after you have food poisoning, because your whole, like, flora is going to be off. I mean, don't get me started on after you have antibiotics. So there's a lot of prevention that can be going on that no one ever talks about, because it's not, there's no real money in prevention. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if no one gets sick, what are they going to do all day? Right, and I think that's the bottom line. It's like, unfortunately, it comes to like the education around where the where the sales is, and like you're going to make much more money prescribing medication than you are prescribing exercise. Like that's unfortunate, but um, for your book, I don't want to let you go just yet. But where can people find out your book? More details about it. Uh, my website is AaronWathenWellness dot com. It is on sale at Amazon, and it's in Barnes and Noble. And I think that's it as far as like international places. And is there a is there a chapter in your book that's surprising, like some another another that like kind of stands out and people would be like, "Whoa, I didn't know that," or "Thank heavens, I now know that." Well, I give a lot of real life examples of how to get out of things you don't want to do involving food. <laughs> like, for example, like how to get out of when people hand you cake at kids' birthday parties, or how to get out of it when someone's pushing food at you you don't want to eat. Because oftentimes we'll have clients they're like, "Well, I had to eat it. My mother made it for me." I'm like, "Oh no, no, you always have a choice." And so here are the you know 25 ways I get out of things because that's reality. I can't just have you live in a vacuum and tell you not to ever be around sugar again or be around food that's triggering to you because that's not the world we live in. And there's always going to be stress. They're not going to stop making ice cream just because you don't want to eat it anymore. What's the one thing you can control? Our actions, our thoughts, right? So how are we going to get those in check? By staying the course. So as long as we have that part down, you know, life and ice cream, they're, they're going to do a thing. <laughs> I think that's interesting because, like, anywhere we go, like, for us, one of our tips when trying to live a healthier lifestyle or maybe when people just start to work with us, we tell them, like, you have to let people know. 
and they don't they don't want to because they've gone through so many fed diets and they haven't yeah. worked but if you're if you're keeping it a secret you're not doing anyone any good i think a lot of people find it very challenging to go to family or friends and then be able to say no or be able to stay on track i i think a lot of it like most things in the execution if you say you know ahead of time give them notice maybe you organize something else Versus if you sit there when everyone else is eating pie and lecture them on the dangers of gluten, <laughs> like nobody wants to be around that person, right? So I think, you know, if everyone else is eating, eating for example, blueberry pie and you just have blueberries and you don't act like a miserable person about it and you don't wag your finger at them, unless they have a problem, they're not going to say anything. So I think so much of it is how you act about it, but... I do think planning ahead and telling people, but also, quite frankly, if you're with people you can't tell this to, maybe you shouldn't be going there in the first place. <laughs> you're in the wrong room? <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, I don't know where you're going, but I'm just saying that kind of an indication that maybe these aren't your people. Yeah. Just throw it out there. <laughs> I, I think that that kind of reminds me of if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong room. Well, that's also one. <laughs> It's, I think it's the same thing when it comes to food. Like if you're, if you go into a room and you feel judged with every nutrition choice you make, probably sit in the wrong room. Yeah, it's interesting because I had this really uh, crazy experience where I went to my client's house for a, a weekend. I just happened to be in town, trying to stay with her. I was like, all right. And then she's like, well, can I eat in front of you? And I said, okay. I said, yeah, of course. So <laughs> I went to her house and I didn't say anything right away her husband's like just so you know I don't care what you say I'm gonna eat what I want and I was like you're not my client dude like well, this has been a very eye-opening conversation so uh but she's a real problem with bread and he brought home 12 baguettes one night who was gonna eat all of them thank you exactly <laughs> so she ate half the one in the middle of the night and she comes and wakes me up we should talk about it I was like oh my god I'm in food coach health this is, <laughs> this is insanity. So she's like, can we talk about it? I'm like, uh, sure. So we talked about it for like 20 minutes, and then I'm like, I got to go back to sleep. I, I can't think that well because it's like middle of the night. Talk about it some more in the morning and, you know, whatever. And then once I get home and start sort of doing like a postmortem, she said, I was really surprised because when we went out to dinner, you weren't a miserable cow about <laughs> ordering. You didn't ask them for 14 things on the side, and you didn't, you know, you, you basically ate what, you didn't eat all of it, but you ate what was on the menu. And I said, well, because I kind of know, you know, crispy means this, and Renee sauce means that. And I said, because I, I, said, I don't, I, you know, I don't think you're the bride basket, because I just didn't know how to navigate a menu. And I also want other people feeling uncomfortable, but I said that takes time. It also takes confidence that I know that I need to feel my best so I know how to eat that way. And I don't want to wake up the next morning and remember what I ate the night before because it didn't digest well. So that's how a lot of my choices are made. Because there are many days, and I talk about it in my book, where I wake up and the first thing is like, what did I eat? Because I'm so bloated or gross feeling. And... You know, if I have a client that's like, I don't know what to do when I go on vacation. I'm like, just think about how you want to feel when you walk in the door when you're done. Because if you if you want to walk in from your you know, 10-day ski trip feeling great because you skied and you were outside and you had a good time, or do you want to feel like you spent way too much time freaking beer in the lodge, either way, you're, it's up to you. Well, that's interesting because when people go on, like, vacation, like, for me, I mean, I, I don't agree with the traditional lifestyle that most people live of especially when it comes to like in a job you don't really like then you get one week a year and that's it so yeah. people get like so excited unfortunately so many get a very short amount of time to vacation and then they come back 10 pounds heavier feeling horrible and i'm like that's all you have for the whole year and you chose to make yourself feel horrible like i don't understand it at all well, that fun. yeah i know so, um, but the, the other thing I wanted to mention was, it, well, it, and I know it's I, one thing that's funny I wanted to mention is like we're at the grocery store and um, in a small town, most people know who you are. 
And we've had people actually like hide their <laughs> hide their grocery carts and like fun? push them to the side and like stand in front of them. I wonder what was in there. Was it, like a bomb or something? No. <laughs> <laughs> And we're like, we don't care. Like, you want to make your own choices, your own decisions. Like, I'm not judging your cart. Have whatever you want. I know. Isn't that funny? <laughs> the fact that you try to hide it tells me everything I need to know. <laughs> right. And you don't even need to look. You know there's stuff in there they shouldn't be having. Yeah, exactly. Um, when I used to teach spin, um, I had all these, like, m- millennials, like, you know, 20-somethings. And I would rent them out, you know, restaurants and bars <laughs> she would always I'd always and they're always I'd earn them the night before I taught taught like a really early Friday morning class and I never drank on Thursday I don't really drink ever but I never drank on Thursday nights and they would be wasted and they're like I'm definitely coming tomorrow morning and I would always say okay and they'd come next morning just hung over mostly because they had told me they were going to come but what's also interesting is if whatever they were eating they always blame somebody else like oh those are so-and-so's hot wings and they'd have like hot wing juice on their hands, on their face, in their teeth, like, and I didn't even ask about the hot wings, they were just, like, they, I mean, if, if you feel like you need to rationalize your food, or hide your cart, you got a problem, like, there's stories about your food, you got a problem, like, I, I can't tell you how many times people will tell me this huge five-minute converse, five-minute explanation for why they ate a piece of cake, and I always say, if your food has a story, there's a problem, <laughs> Because I can't tell you what I ate for lunch yesterday. I mean, I'm sure if I had to, I could. Because there's no story about it. <laughs> it was just lunch, right? But if there's a huge explanation for why you had it, then you're coming from the wrong place. Tell me what it was like when you were making these, I would call them lifestyle changes around nutrition, around your family and friends. Meaning that just how they were on board or weren't on board or yeah i think like for us like i think we've all been there you show up at a, at a friend's house it it's it was a slow transition for me like my friends I, like the guys that i grew up with they were in the oil many of them work in the oil business they're corporate downtown calgary alberta so they all have beer and steak <laughs> so i go in there and order a salad and have a lemon water and i mean <laughs> of course that was an issue early on, but it's been a handful of years now, and now that's been accepted. But I think a lot of people aren't willing to go through that scrutiny. <laughs> yeah, I agree. And um, I was just curious about what it was like for your family or friends when you started to make choices. Um, for me, it was similar because, you know, obviously girls' night out is different if you're not drinking. Because, you know, ha- I used to always be like a white wine. Not that I drank that much white wine, but I used to always drink. You know, we went out. Now I'm just more of this strictly the spritzer of the white wine. Um, but I also don't partake. I always eat. I don't. I always eat before I leave the house because I don't really necessarily need to eat in restaurants anymore. I mean, I will if I don't have a choice, like on vacation. I just don't really trust anybody. Not then they're going to poison me. But I would just rather eat lunch or dinner at home versus going to a restaurant where there's like 14 types of apps. You can't hear anybody. You can't focus on the food. Next thing you know, you're eating, you know, nachos. It, it, it just assume, I would just assume be done eating for the day before I leave the house. So that's been a big transition. And by the way, I don't even have a problem paying for the food as long as it's not too much alcohol. <laughs> because... That's kind of, you know, the cost of doing business, but there used to be a time where, like, I would, like, that would be my dinner. My dinner would have been, you know, all appetizers, standing up, which is a horrible time to eat and a horrible environment to eat, but so now it's, like, I'll see before I leave. You also, if you're psychologically done eating for the day and you completely are just in that mindset of, like, I'm done, that isn't, that isn't your food. That isn't available to you. And so then when you get home from wherever you're at, you can get to bed that much sooner because you're not digesting food if you ate dinner at 10 versus if you ate dinner at 6 before you left the house. So it just sort of sets you up for a better night's sleep as well. So those sort of things I've done, I mean, if you can't get out of it, it's like a dinner party, but just little tricks like that. And it wasn't necessarily the easiest thing in the world 
you know, with some social things, but now everybody's just used to it. And also I think too, you know, writing a book that's pretty public, people just sort of write that off as that's just Aaron, you know? Well, I think it, once people realize or accept that that's your lifestyle, that's how you live, that's how you teach. I mean, early on, it's probably a bit more challenging, but for those people that, what about the, for those people that aren't, like they don't have a book, those people that are just trying to make changes, like your, your clients, like that's probably a bit I mean, more challenging. Like for them, I always start with like the, ch the challenges that are the least painful. Like for example, like if the hardest thing in the world seems like, you know, say no to your grandma's lasagna. Let's start with the things that are easier to say no with. So the stuff in the break room or, you know, the nuts at happy hour, because let's face it, those are dirty anyway. So things like that, and then we'll work our way up to eventually getting to grandma's lasagna, because by then you'll have a lot of experience saying no. You'll have the momentum behind you and the confidence that you will eventually be able to just nicely decline it. So I think starting with things that you, you, you're eating because it's there, you're eating because it's a habit, you're eating because you're kind of a little bit lazy sometimes, let's be honest, and not judging it, but just knowing that you're there, and that's okay. Yeah, well, I think it's taking like taking those small progressive steps. Like everyone wants to like, watch a TV show, and then they're like, oh, grab a garbage bag and throw everything from your fridge into the garbage bag in the pantry. And, like we don't know, we know that doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, it, it's very dramatic to do that, but it's also too the pendulum swing is too much. Like. <laughs> You know, like, let's, let's, you know, make some small choices. Like, if you're drinking regular soda, let's just every other round drink water. Or like, if you're drinking, you know, a lot of alcohol, every other round drink water. I mean, there's, there's ways to do it. Ideally, you just hear me talk once and you're done, right? No, but that's how human beings work. So if we were to you know, analyze what we're eating, and just a lot of things we eat that we don't even really care about. We're just sort of in this kind of lazy place about it. And that's okay, because it's so easy to be lazy. It's so easy to get takeout. It's so easy to do, you know, frozen foods and stuff versus making it yourself. Yeah, like, I suppose it's with anything. Like, we're so used to, like, text message or, like, a I mean, no one's going to sit down and write a, except our, to our grandma, maybe. Like, who's going to sit down and write a handwritten note when he can send a text in three seconds? <laughs> well, what's your thing is, I, um, beginning of the year, one of my resolutions, because my, my resolution, resolution used to always be, like, lose weight, right? For years and years and years, so I always lose weight. Well, I don't have the resolution anymore. So my resolutions now are things like text less. <laughs> so oftentimes I'll just say to someone, well, I'm getting in the car, can you call me? And, like, half the time they won't call me. And then I'll text them when I get to wherever. And I'm like, you didn't call. They're like, I didn't think you meant it. I thought it was a joke. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I actually wanted to talk to you. So I will just call people now. And they're always happy when I call them. But anyone younger than, like, 30 is always, like, very, like, why are we talking? Yeah. I would rather talk to someone than text if given the choice. But I can't necessarily text you if I'm, you know, walking in the doctor's office. Because, you know, it's like, I think texting is, like, short, but when people text constantly all day, just call them. You know, I think it's funny is that we, we used to worry about, like, how many minutes are on our phone plans. <laughs> no, who does that now? I know, I was, I was telling my daughter, she's 13, about my long distance phone bill in college. She was like, what is that? <laughs> like, uh, something we used to be very scared of. <laughs> right. um, you know what else I was gonna say oh yeah I'm the same way you know what I've been doing is I'm not like I don't like to text like it's not really my thing um, I try to avoid the phone in, in most situations uh, I'll use email or messenger but I use the I've been using voice um, you know you can use the voice message I love those yeah those are cool Yeah. so I'll use that Like, and I'm sometimes I'll like sit there and type and I'm like yeah I don't want to death. I just don't want to do it <laughs> Hit it. Yeah. <laughs> if, but at least they're hearing your voice and you can tell you can tell like sarcasm that you and I like so you can tell like I'm gonna put on a shirt for you because you're special you know that kind of thing versus wait is she kidding <laughs> <laughs> and you know what I think it's crazy like maybe a bit off topic here but I think it's crazy like 
how we there's so many like relationships damaged from miscommunication or like not understanding one another or being short and, and like it's I feel like communicating or even sitting down across from someone it's like a lost art to have a conversation or communicating properly I absolutely agree I am um, I, I, I I'm picking on millennials again but the other day I was encountering a couple and they were there were these two sisters and they were sitting next to each other in a coffee booth texting having coffee with each other I'm like what the heck is going on um, do you think they're so, texting each other? I have no idea what they were doing, but it was like, what are you doing? So I, so my daughter, I always tell her, I don't want to see her phone. She can text in her room, but if she comes downstairs, I don't want to see it. This I think is rude to come down and like where everyone's like interacting as a family and be like texting. Oh my God. Yeah. I, like I can't, I can't even fathom like what it'd be like a parent in this day and age. Like I feel like a grandpa talking about this, but like when when we go to a coffee shop, you see like a younger group of individuals, five of them sitting there. Not one of them are talking to each other. And I'm like, no, yes. yeah. And like, why you guys go out together? Just go out alone. Like, why are you there together? Well, the thing too is like, so about that is when I pick up my daughter from a sleepover, and I'll say, "What'd you do?" And she, "Oh, we just Facetime boys." I'm thinking, when I was your age, we snuck out. <laughs> <laughs> You're probably happy that they're only FaceTime. No, but I'm saying, but for me, it's like we, you know, we had to sneak out, we had to hide our tracks, we had to like, you know, all the stuff that we had to do that to, they just like FaceTime, like it's so easy. Um, but it's also, I think, kind of lazy, like because they don't necessarily see the need to be in the same room together as often, because they can see each other, they can hear each other's voice, but it's not the same thing, and. Again, maybe just old school, but I would rather be in someone's like vibe than not. I think it's valuable. Well, oh, for us, we used to like we would go and knock on like all the kids in the neighborhood. We would go and knock on their door and be like, oh. "Who wants to come to the park and play football or hockey with a tennis ball in the park?" Like we would do that. And I think like for now, it's almost sad we go like in our neighborhood. You visit a couple of different parks always empty or other parks as well, but they don't, you wouldn't go knock on someone's door. That'd be a crazy idea. You would text them to see if they're around. And if they're around, you probably wouldn't go over. You would just like snap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, because my son, he's 10 and he has a headphone and they're, they're whatever. Yeah, he, everything is prearranged. There's no organic just interacting anymore. As far as I can tell, it's all electronic, but when I used to teach Pilates, because I'm a classical Pilates teacher as well, um, we had to add this whole line of uh, movement because so many people have forward head syndrome from computers and driving and texting. Because when Joe Pilates invented Pilates, most people weren't like this all day. So, you know, everyone needs to open up and just expand their chest and their neck is all jacked. But especially teenagers because they're texting – and even though it doesn't seem like that dramatic of a movement over time, and also you know, the shoulders are hunched. So they really have to get them to open up their chest, but they don't think about that. They really don't. No. You know what I wanted to do is I've always thought about this, like doing this graphic, and I'm not like a graphic artist by any means, but getting someone to put them together, like, you know, like cavemen were like hunched. Yeah. Like this. <laughs> so then like slowly we've got to be like this. And, and then, then now, we're, now, we're yeah. now we're going back to this. <laughs> no, I agree. I think that's a very good yeah, the caveman. Exactly. Uh, I think it's really weird because I'll be with my daughter and like we'll be in the car and I'll like we'll be a lull in the conversation and she's watching a YouTube video where they're decorating cakes. I'm like, really? You get 30 seconds. You were that bored. You had to just watch someone. <laughs> You know what the th you know what the difference is here. I can tell the difference between Canada. I'm in LA right now. I sp I sp spend time back and forth, and in Canada we don't have unlimited data yet. Oh yeah. So it's not quite so bad, but here it's like madness. Like the Uber driver was watching a a TED talk, and I was like, first of all, drive. And second <laughs> of all, how are you streaming that? Because you know, like we would run out of data in like an hour yeah, your dad would be eating up for the month yeah 
So it, I, just, I think, just think it's funny. It's like it's much worse here because it, it's, it's unlimited, but you see everyone doing it much more often here. Oh, I agree. I think that's probably a lot of it because, like, to circle back to the long-distance phone bill, I mean, I, I remember there was a girl of my, in college who would call her friend, and every day they would watch a soap opera together that was on during the day. And her phone bill was, like, hundreds and hundreds of dollars. Calling during the day for an hour? Crazy. Yeah. But now no one thinks about, like, long-distance phone calls. And, you know, it's just no one, like, the kids don't think about it. But I do think unlimited data is is not necessarily always a good thing. <laughs> because you have Uber drivers watching TED Talks. And supposed to be driving you somewhere. <laughs> and kids watching videos about cooking when you pause to, like, stop at a stoplight. So... It, is, it isn't always necessarily the best thing, but there are some benefits to the technology, like all the, you know, like Apple Watches and all the wearable tech, but I don't think most people even understand the wearable exercise tech. That's a great point. I don't know anyone that is like, besides like business people that have like developed them or like try to use them for their clients. I don't know any individual that's like, oh, I got this new app I'm doing using on my Apple Watch. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I go to Orange Theory, which is all about the tech, which is which doesn't even – if you're in really good shape like I am, they don't, the tech doesn't work because I recover too quickly. <laughs> and then I take – then when I go back up, it's just always like this. I, their baseline person isn't – in that great of a shape. So the tech is for average. I think a lot of the tech, well, I mean, it makes sense, right? Who's their average customer? Who's their average person? You know, but I think a lot of the wearable tech is great, but it isn't everything. So, Aaron, tell us one more time. I, I know like I could probably talk to you all day. Um, I want to respect your time as well. Tell us one more time before we wrap things up where they can get your book or maybe more details about yourself. Sure. Um, Aaron Wathen Wellness. Uh, that's my Instagram handle. That's also my website. And my book is, it is sweet. Yeah. Um, it's on Amazon. You can get it on your Kindle. It's at Barnes & Noble if you're old school and want the actual tactile book. Awesome. Thanks so much, Aaron. I appreciate you. you coming on. Uh, we'll, we'll link this to, we'll put the show note, or sorry, we'll well, we're going to put this on YouTube, our YouTube channels, youtube.com slash trueformlife. We're going on Instagram right now. Hey, guys. <laughs> we'll put that up on Instagram. And then I'm actually going to put this on LinkedIn. I've been doing some more work on LinkedIn. So okay. um, sure. I will for sure. Thanks so much, Aaron. I appreciate it. Bye. See you, Instagrammers. Thanks for watching. So are you in a